Welcome to the Boat Galley Podcast. I'm Carolyn Sherlock, here with tips, reviews, and how-tos for your cruising adventure. Slow down, slow down. Let's talk about cruising when you're older. Dave is 78, and I'm 56. More than once, we've been asked for our take on geezer cruising. So here it goes. First, though, it's important to know that we have both been sailors since our teens and began cruising full-time when Dave was 64. That said, there is no one-size-fits-all answer to the question of whether you can cruise when you're 75 or older. Actively cruising, that is, going new places and primarily anchoring out, isn't for everyone at any age. Cruising outside the continental U.S., without its support systems, that is weather forecasts, coast guard, towing services, network of marinas, the ICW for those on the east coast, is a lot harder no matter what the age. A large part of the equation is wanting to do it. There is no age limit actually on cruising. However, that said, here are some things that we think are important in being able to cruise in later years. First is health. Dave is generally in good health, but we take care of health issues as they arise and don't leave a place with good medical facilities when either of us has an issue going on. For example, this past spring Dave was diagnosed with a prostate infection, which required an eight-week course of antibiotics and then follow-up tests. We delayed leaving for the Bahamas until we had the all clear. Dave also tends to be in the use it or lose it camp and works to maintain his physical fitness, balance, and agility, all of which are also helped by living on the boat, and all of which helps us avoid injuries. That said, we have also tried to lessen the boat's physical requirements, but it's still a good daily workout. It's a bit of a circular proposition. You have to be physically fit to cruise, and cruising keeps you physically fit. Staying injury-free is a key concept for us. Broken bones, bruises, pulled muscles, and such all take far longer to heal as we age, and it's harder to regain full function afterwards. Many of our choices are driven by trying to lessen the chances of injury. It goes without saying that you have to be mentally sharp, but I'd also argue that cruising tends to keep your brain working. Figuring routes, solving problems, and having new experiences has to be better than sitting on the sofa watching reruns. Next up is our boat choice. Barefoot Gal is a 34-foot Gemini 105M catamaran, and she's smaller and lighter than our previous boat, which was a heavy, blue-water-capable Tayana 37. The sails are considerably smaller, making the mane easier to raise, the Genoa less strenuous to furl and unfurl, the spinnaker simpler to set, and all the sails taking less muscle, even with winches. She requires much, a much smaller anchor, 35 pounds versus 66. All of this means she's easier to sail or motor, and translates to less chance of serious injury if something goes haywire. Barefoot Gal is also very maneuverable, which makes all close quarters operations, that is, anchoring, docking, locking, mooring, passing through bridges and narrow channels, easier and less stressful. She's also faster, both sailing and motoring, making days shorter and less tiring. With a catamaran, it's easier to get into and out of a dinghy, as well as to load and unload provisions and gear. She's more stable for doing anything on deck, whether underway or at anchor. There's no long flight of steps down the companionway, and that makes it easier to move items with less chance for a serious fall. By no means is a small catamaran the only good choice for older cruisers, but choosing a boat that makes cruising easier with less risk of injury is very important. For many of us, financially it's possible to have a larger boat as the years go by, but Dave and I are not at all convinced that bigger is necessarily better. Our next item is our water maker. Cruising, and primarily being at anchor, or even in a mooring field, you have to either lug jerry cans of water, make periodic trips to the water dock, or have a water maker. We opt for the water maker. 
Forty pound jerry cans get old to lift a board and pour into the water fill, and docking has other chances for injury, as well as conditions sometimes making it impractical. Our next big one is dinghy davits and an outboard crane. The boat came with dinghy davits, which we have beefed up and added extra purchase on the blocks. We also added an outboard crane so that we could put the motor on the stern rail when going from one anchorage to another. This takes a lot less strength than hand lifting the outboard and then putting the dinghy on deck as we did when we were first cruising our previous boat, meaning that we can have a larger outboard and that I could handle these chores without Dave should he be sick or injured. Another item on the davits, crane, and other systems under load is having good blocks of a decent size. We have upgraded many of the blocks. Our preference is Harkin, despite the cost, and they make a huge difference. Also on the dinghy davits, we found that adding a block with an integrated cam cleat so the line cleated automatically when pulling the dinghy up made it much easier to raise the dinghy when the motor is on it. All we do is pull a foot or two, and the line is already cleated while we reach to grab the next handful of line. No having to hold it with one hand. Then, when we're through, we put a safety cleat around a horn cleat. Next item up is our electric windlass. Okay, I'll admit, we think that an electric windlass is an important piece of safety gear for all cruisers, as it means that you'll re-anchor it as many times as necessary to get a good set in a good location. But it's even more important as we get older. With it, we have no hesitation in moving if conditions change or another boat anchors too close for safety. And if we're suddenly on a lee shore, an electric windlass is much safer to use when the bow is bouncing up and down and we need to get out of there now. Our next item is weather windows and routing. Now, I don't want to give the impression that we're scared by weather but we do make more of an effort to avoid rough passages than we used to. We just don't recover as fast as we did 15 or 20 years ago, and we're more prone to injuries as well. Simply put, we're not as strong or as agile. Our style of cruising is a little slower and hopefully a little less stressful. We're more conservative in our choice of weather windows and generally don't move on ones that look iffy. I'm not saying we necessarily wait for perfect weather, and we're not looking to motor everywhere in flat seas. But yes, we're willing to wait a few days for better weather. It's a matter of not exhausting ourselves and not risking injuries or gear breakage. We're also a little faster to move to a more protected anchorage than we were 15 years ago. I think this is simply a function of more years spent cruising and riding out more squalls in places that we wished we weren't. The next, we try to create routes with a little less daily mileage. We try for no more than 50 miles. We also try not to have multiple long days in a row. We try to get into a new anchorage by late afternoon rather than right at sunset. Sometimes long days can't be avoided and sometimes there's no alternative to an overnight passage, but we realize that we don't have the stamina we used to. We love cruising and don't think there's any particular age at which people should plan to stop. Perhaps the style of cruising will change, the boat may change, the location may be different than the original dream. The important factor is to figure out a style that works with any limitations you may have and do everything possible to avoid injuries that could put serious limitations on mobility. Until next time then. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please be sure to subscribe in your podcast app. Just search for the Boat Galley Podcast. And reviews are always appreciated. Until next time, then. Slow down.